I am now recording all of you. So, okay, so welcome to Fort Collins One Million Cups. We're going to start with introductions from people who either haven't been here a while or are new to our group. So who would like to introduce themselves? David, you can give a start. Well, I, my name's David. I'm actually a Denver guy and through a bit of confusion ended up on the Fort Collins things, but I'm very <laughs> Happy to be here with you all. Um, I'm a former IT guy from with an ancient master's degree in computer science. I decided to brush off my skills by learning Android development, and I've written a life-saving mobile app mm. for people who go out hiking or motorsports, motorcycling, people who go off in remote areas and stuff. Got two patents on it so far. I'm very excited about it. If any of you spend time outside, you should download it. If you're on Android, uh, venture safely. Uh, might save your life. Fantastic. Thank you. Appreciate that. And who else uh, would like to introduce themselves this morning? John. Good morning. Hi. Hi, Jenna. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm John Garvey. I'm the founder and chief storytelling officer at Garvington Creative. I was just starting to attend One Million Cups regularly when everything got shut down. So that's a bummer. But I'm a marketing advisor, so I work with companies to make sure that their messaging is super crystal clear and succinct and compelling and enticing. And I'm a copywriter, so I help you tell your story and describe your work in ways that are memorable and that people relate to. Great. Thank you. It's good to see you this morning. And then one more introduction. Thank you, Renee. All right, I'll introduce myself. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dr. Renee and I work with Helping Parents Parent. I work with parents to help calm the chaos and the overwhelm that typically comes with having children. Basically, I help parents get their kids to listen and behave. Because I want parents to enjoy parenting while their kids are still young, which is quite challenging right now that they have their kids at home 24 seven. I also wear another hat, which I like to call my nose. I'm a professional clown. I am Jalapeno the Clown and I clown around at all occasions. Fantastic, thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, so for those of you who haven't been here before or have Zoom fatigue to the point where you don't remember what day of the week it is, uh, two things I would like you to do for me. One, I would like you to open up uh, the participant box that you see down at the bottom and you'll see your opportunity to raise your hand or uh, make other kinds of fun icon commentary as we go through that. We'll be using that for me to call on people as we have comments and feedbacks for our presenters. The second box I'd like you to open is, of course, our fabulous chat box. And you can uh, make commentary, answer some questions, do fun stuff over in there. So that is an option. So we're going to start this morning. We have two presentations. Uh, we have wolf and heron and then cow tipping. So we have an animal themed day going here. Uh, so extra bonus points for anybody who brings an animal into the Zoom meeting today. I may have to go find my cat. And uh, so we'll get started with that. We're going to have Stephanie Judd uh, with Wolf and Heron who will be leading out. For those of you who remember, Stephanie's presented to us a couple of times before and may remember that she is a fabulous uh, roller derby girl. But since that's not the thing that she's doing right now uh, in lockdown, she has taken up aerial silks. So for those of you who are not familiar with that, you absolutely want to go look that up. Stephanie, if you'll take it away. Lovely. Let me share my screen so you all can see what I'm looking at. And I'm going to try to just, can you all see? Yes, I've got your PowerPoint presentation. Out. All right. Cool. Well, thanks for all, all of you for listening. And thank you for in advance for the feedback that you give, because I always really, really value and enjoy getting feedback from this particular group. So thanks for the platform and the time. Um, my name is Stephanie Judd. I'm a founder of Wolf and & Heron, and today the discussion I'd specifically like to have with you is on our product strategy as we try to navigate our new COVID normal. Yay! <laughs> I'm going to ask you 
Um, I'm going to take you through a little bit of our history as a business and focus specifically on our influential storytelling offerings. Um, and now that the world has shifted, we need a new way to think about our product strategy around our influential storytelling offerings. And I'm hoping that I can source ideas and frameworks and experiments to try from you all and maybe even get some, some thoughts on how to potentially market the ideas. Let's start with a little bit about who we are. Uh, Wolf & Heron is a company that helps people lead with inspiration and convene powerfully. Everything we do is supported by our expertise in influence science, inspiration, and human engagement. We have three pillars to our organization, meeting design and facilitation, professional development, and one-on-one -on -one coaching. Meeting design is really, for the sake of today, it's largely a consulting service, but it has within it a product that we offer that's called a meeting in the mailbox. And that's essentially a kit that provides whoever purchases it with all of the tools and skills and materials and everything that they need to lead a really engaging meeting or a really in interactive and engaging meeting um, on one of our topics. Uh, professional development is primarily a teaching and training service and it's where we offer high impact. We do the facilitation, but we offer high impact in-person learning experiences on one of our topics. And then of course, one-on-one -on -one coaching is exactly what you would expect. It's telephone conversations. Um, and again, it's usually centered around one of our topics. I'll get to the topics in a second, but for your context, something that's worth noting, our professional development business is by far the biggest part of our business. It was about 80% of our revenue in 2019 and meeting the, mail, like the meeting design and facilitation and our coaching made up the difference. Um, if you think about these as pillars, these three pillars, across each pillar is what we call, um, what we have is our topic center. So things like uh, we teach influence power, confidence, presentation skills, networking, grit, all of the things that we know from our experience and um, knowledge of influence science, all of the skills that really help people show up powerfully, lead meetings well, really engage people as from, from a leadership perspective, irrespective of what their titles are. Um, influential storytelling is by far our most popular topic area. And actually in 2019, the, the, the three pillars combined just for influential storytelling made up 64% of our revenue. So it's a big, big, big topic for us. Um, storytelling is the hottest Google AdWord that drives traffic to our website. It accounts for almost all of our inbound interest and was responsible for more than half of our revenue. Um, we have a meeting in the mailbox kit and this particular, the storytelling meeting in the mailbox kit is actually one of the few that we've been able to sell to people we don't know which was a big, big um, you know, win for us last year when we were like, whoa, a stranger purchased this, this is amazing. Um, our workshop, our in-person workshop on influential storytelling is driving just by itself more than half of our business. And so you can see the numbers at the bottom there are the total amount that the storytelling counts for. So all, this adds up to 64% to of our revenue. And it gives you a sense of how important the storytelling topic is to our business. Well, COVID happened. Wah, wah. <laughs> the professional development and meeting and meeting sign and facilitation is largely built around in-person experiences. People have to travel. People have to get together in a room. And well, that died. And so we're now at a place where we have to think about how we want to repackage our storytelling content in a new way. So if I were to look at the new normal, one of the things that did happen in March was that we very quickly converted our, our in-person workshop into a virtual experience. And we were actually able to deliver it a couple of times to the, to the corporate clients and the universities that we already had standing engagements with. Um, but that was two months ago now, and we're not getting any new inbound interest on, on storytelling in general because, well, companies aren't investing in L&D. We have been dominantly a B2B business. We sell largely into organizations and companies that are thinking about developing their people. And right now, that is not what they're doing. They're trying to hold on to their business. And so we're kind of like, okay, what else are we doing? But what has been interesting since the COVID crisis started is that we've seen a side effect is that all these individuals have more time. Um, if companies aren't investing in people, people are investing in themselves. And so we've seen our coaching practice see an uptick. We've actually gone from about three to four clients on a, in a general month to now we're almost at 40, which is kind of amazing. 
Um, but the problem with coaching as a whole is that it's not scalable to the level that we'd like to scale to. When we can do our B2B stuff, we can charge much higher price point. And coaching really is trading time for money. And my business is only me and my partner. And the two of us have only a certain amount of time. And we can't scale it up the way we'd like to if this is going to be the new normal that we're living in. So we have to think about we have to think about other ways to deliver our content, package our content in a way that's going to be interesting. For now, we're focusing on storytelling because that has been historically the most popular thing um, that we offer. And, and we know people still are interested in storytelling because they're coming to us for storytelling coaching, um, but we, we need to figure out a different delivery mechanism. And so that's what we're, that's what we're experimenting with. One experiment that we've started to run is we started offering free story hours. And these are virtual opportunities for people to get together. It's intended to be very casual, low stress, low stakes. And the idea is to give people a platform and a space to tell a five minute story and get feedback on it so that they can develop into more influential storytellers. The other lovely side effect of these story hours is that it does offer us a lot of um, food for, for content. We can post YouTube content, we, we're developing a podcast, we have blogs now that are built around these story hours. So it's, it's a great um, initial ground for some real, real content and real um, interest in lead gen and that kind of thing. Um, we offer it once a week on Fridays around lunchtime and it's just been a lovely, fun thing to do. The first time we did it, we had two participants and now we consistently are getting 25 to 30 registrants, which is just amazing. It's absolutely amazing. So we're like, okay, this is something, let's build on it. The other thing that we have is this idea to build an e-course, um, a self-guided e-course. Ideally, it's a higher value product. The challenge is that it is a big investment for us. And we know for historically that we're not very good marketing people. We're much better at the sales process, at the B2B engagement process. And so the marketing um, specifically and, and, and um, particularly for people we don't know, we don't have relationships with, we're worried about the marketing thing. And so we're kind of like, Ugh, can we prove ourselves before we do all of the investment to, to find ways to ladder up, um, ladder up the price point of the customers that come to us? So the big challenge that's staring at us is how do we move people from the free story hours to this e-course? We of course have story coaching and of course we have the virtual and in-person workshops, but who knows if the in-person workshop's ever gonna be something we can develop. Um, the virtual workshop, we're playing with uh, the right delivery mechanism, but it is a synchronous experience. And so people are only available to do it if they're available at that time when we offer it. And so it has its pros and cons. The story coaching, of course, has its pros and cons. But we're kind of curious what else we should be thinking about. How else should we be packaging our, inf our content and our information? How should we be making this available to customers and encouraging the come? What should we be doing? And so that's what I'm here for. Ask you for ideas, frameworks, experiments. Perhaps you even have some thoughts around maybe sequencing this in a different order. I don't know. That's where we are. I'm going to leave it at that. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. Appreciate it. Round of applause for Ms. Stephanie. Always enjoy having you present. Uh, so pop back to your ask slide real quick and let everybody take a quick look at that. Okay, so ideas, frameworks, experiments to try. And if you will stop your screen sharing, we'll get everybody back in front of you. And for those of you who would like to get in on uh, providing feedback, if you'll raise your hand in the participant box, we'll start with that conversation here. Um, and it looks like, John, did you have a comment or feedback you wanted to start with? Sure, I hadn't, <laughs> I was, uh... I didn't actually raise my virtual hand, but I, I do have some thoughts. So I, I pulled up your website and I think as a slogan, okay, lead with inspiration, convene powerful, pow powerfully. I think that's a, that works great as a slogan. Um, it's not really, one thing that I always think when I look at someone's homepage is with someone who had never heard of you before immediately understand what you do and why it matters to them and, and what problem you help them solve, what opportunities you create. So if you want to push, I mean, the storytelling coaching is your, 
primary source of revenue and it seems to be what you really enjoy and what you're good at, I would, I would just have something very like maybe a 15 or 20 word, um, like one liner at the top of your site that says something to the effect of, uh, leverage the, you know, we coach people to tell powerful stories that help them achieve greater impact and, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. As, uh, what I'm hearing John say really clearly to me is, is also the thing that I'm, I'm kind of sensing is that I'm not getting a clear value proposition based mm -hmm. off of the shift in priorities in the economy. So I, the, you have a phenomenal value proposition in the regular time frame, but now, <laughs> right. now we're looking at like, how do we help people understand that this is a value to them to heat, keep their company running, right? Yeah. And so that's, you've got to speak to the moment in it. And I think that there's, yeah. there's some potential in that. Matt, how about... Go ahead, well, one of, the, one of the things that we've been, and this is actually a sort of a separate existential process problem, but Wolf and Heron has always been an influence company and uh -huh. one of, and yet 64% of our revenue is storytelling. And so we do have an existential question. Like, are we actually just a storytelling company and should we just g let go of the rest of it? I have and, thoughts about that, but I want other people to talk first. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Matt, what have you got for your Stephanie? Um, you, one of the things you brought up was about the, um, the problem with having to have synchronous interaction mm. for the, for the, the coaching sessions or for the storytelling group sessions. I forget what, it, what it's the, the specific the item. Workshop, yeah. yeah. The virtual workshop. Um, I wonder if you might be able to move it to a more asynchronous format. Um, now you don't want to lose the, the human to human interaction because since we're all socially isolated, that's mm -hmm. huge. Mm -hmm. um, like any level of, of human interaction is incredibly important. Um, but you may, you know, if you're, if you're coaching these people or doing workshopping stuff and, and you know, having more than just one interaction, mm -hmm. it might work to have, you know, your workshop group meet once synchronously, everybody, you know, tells a story or says hi, and then you could do a couple of coaching sessions asynchronously individually where people would record the video, uh, you give them feedback and then you can bring everyone back together. And then you also get this uh, as a participant, they would also get this awesome bump in confidence where they go from being terrible at telling stories, the first meeting, then they only work with you. And then everybody comes back and everybody is way more awesome at telling stories. So you have this mm -hmm. huge emotional boost um, of confidence mm -hmm. that would probably help them like keep the habits and move forward rather than just be like, okay, well, there's another skill that I pay a lot of money to, to get. <laughs> Right. So that was just a thought that occurred to me. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. Okay. So it sounds like you're recommending some combo of the coaching and synchronous learning and asynchronous. Right. Um, it just, yeah. Cause activities. I mean, it's, yeah. you gotta, you gotta be adaptable. Of yeah. course it does wind up being very time intensive for you. Well, right now I've got time. So <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> so many of us do. <laughs> And I've, I've also been noticing uh, a lot of innovation around how do we deliver online courses without an online course platform, because it is an investment, as you said, they're expensive. Right. And so does it work better to do worksheets and using a Vimeo account where you can create passwords for the video and then send people that mm -hmm. link with the appropriate password so you don't actually have to invest in a platform until you figure out that this course actually will work right. for what you're looking for, right? Um, uh, yes. We've, we've developed that some at Trebuchet Group and it has been really helpful and incredibly low cost in that That's regard. Good. That's Ozzy, good. Ozzy, your feedback? Whoops. Sorry about that. My uh, computer blinked just as I went to a mute. Um, was it, let me start by t saying something positive about what you put out there and, and you mentioned experimenting. And that's gonna be critical for almost every business going forward because we simply don't know what the emerging environment is gonna be like. We don't know if there's gonna be more lockdowns. We don't know how people are going to react. There are those who are 
uh, really scared and want to wear every PPE imaginable. And those who are fed up with it and just want to be left alone. And so there's this whole range of issues that you're facing and no one really has an answer because in many ways there is no answer, no the answer to be had. So that's um, kind of a key issue. One of the things that we're doing for businesses, one of the things we did was to come up with a framework and you mentioned that. And part of the framework what we ask is, so what, what business are you in after the lockdowns are removed? And that's an important question because we oftentimes think of ourselves as being in the same kind of business, but if the value proposition changes radically, if your business model changes radically, by definition, you're in a different kind of right. business. And so one of the things, if you want to see it, there's a, a short post that I've put up based on our research, and we've been working on this framework for a while, on my LinkedIn um, feed, where we talk about what kind of business is Starbucks going to be in. Because if you read Starbucks value proposition, it is simply impractical in the current environment. It's not, you can't operationalize it. So are people going to be willing to buy Starbucks coffee for the sake of Starbucks coffee? That's not what Starbucks was in. And that's why we're willing to pay five bucks for a cup of coffee, right? So anyways, I think you have some really good ideas as far as trying to figure this out. Mm -hmm. um, take a step back, think about what business is possible, what kind of business you're, you, you can support and you're going to be in, um, and take a look at your value proposition and say, I know what people valued before, but what are they likely to value next? And then test those. Those are where those little experiments that really, you know, deliver an awful lot of uh, insights. Uh, and again, just go to my LinkedIn profile if you want to see what we're doing with Starbucks. I think it's kind of revealing because we, I picked Starbucks precisely because it is almost, we think of them as a coffee place, but actually they share an awful lot with a lot of businesses. So anyway, it's just a few thoughts. Thank you, Ozzy. All right, uh, Renee. Mine's just short. I, I really enjoyed what you're doing and I loved how flexible you're being. Um, one of the things, because I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching that has been helpful to leverage is to offer group coaching. Mm -hmm. And so it's not quite as formal as the classes, which are also a great way to go because those can be passive income that are up there and running, which you can get into and be live if you want or offer a Q&A session if you want, or you can leave them. But with group coaching, it, you have the opportunity to go into breakout rooms, which would offer that more interactive experience that it sounds like you were doing in person, um, but also you can reach more than one person at a time and they can learn from each other's issues or comments or stories that they're telling. What's an appropriate price point for group coaching? That depends on the value you're bringing and what people are willing to pay. <laughs> yeah, right? I, I tend to do a little bit less in group coaching because right. there are more people there, um, but I, I wouldn't drop the price point too low. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, in some ways, that's kind of what our story hours are. It's a, it's a little bit of a group coaching session. Um, and we're offering those for free right now. We've had a few people suggest that we charge for it, but I just, I don't know. There's something kind of lovely about the free offering that is just, oh, it's so heart centered for me that I. <laughs> well, there's also the fact that if you've got people who are coming back for a free offering over and over and over again, at that point, it starts costing you significantly. So first three sessions are free, your next are, you know, 10 bucks a piece or whatever that looks too. like. So that there is not a sense that what you are providing is, is without value, right? If you allow people to do right. free long, it gets to a point where they stop thinking you're valuable. That's a good that point. Regard. David. Your feedback, uh, and then we've got one more, uh, and then we'll move along here. I mean, without knowing very much about this space, I, I mean, you know, it seems like, you know, you, I mean, I'm sure the answer is you probably looked into this, but I just started taking a Coursera class, and I mean, maybe that, have you looked into that as a possible platform for? Yeah, we have looked into Coursera. The challenge with Coursera is that it's very often free or like $5 for a course. It's the same with um, Udemy and some of the other platforms. We're looking, we would like our storytelling course to be in the thousands of dollars um, with, the, with the idea that actually 
maybe one day individuals find it and then get their companies to pay for them to do it. Um, and so that's kind of the, especially because we are dominantly a B2B business, or at least we have been in the past, we know how to speak corporate speak a lot better than we know how to speak like punchy marketing speak. <laughs> so, and so I think there's some of that that we're playing with, but like the competitors that we've looked at are, are IDO and Stanford and Harvard that are putting out storytelling courses that are in the thousands of dollars. And that's kind of the price point we'd like to play at. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Natalie, you'll be our uh, last open comment. Hey, hi everybody. Sorry for joining in late. Uh, yeah, just to, to, to piggyback on what you were saying, and, and Jana, and your question, um, Stephanie, about the free, not free. I mean, I think in you know these days and age, we're going to be on platforms and virtual for a long time. So you've got to make people pay for your service. Otherwise, yeah. as Jana said, you're forever free and your business will die. You need to differentiate that. And I think that Otherwise, you're not going to have the right people attending your, your thing. Uh, well, you may split, say, okay, you have a teaser. You want to see what we do. Or the teaser might be free first time, as Jenna said. But then you have, you, you know, people have to pay. And, and, it, and they have to pay a fair amount of money, not, as you said, five or ten bucks. It's got to be, you know, five hundred or a thousand dollars. Those who are serious, yeah. who want to invest, who have whatever it is that they can get, they'll, they'll, they'll get there. And that's what you want to do. You want to get those customers. Because yeah, the freebies, true. people who are, unfortunately, we know that you know, people don't have means and there's a situation, but there's a ton of this stuff out there available. You're in a different market. You have no yeah. reason to change your market. You know, I mean, and even, you know, and indeed the corporates don't want to, 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 to pay, but there might be a way to say, okay, they don't want to pay, but they may federate the ability to get some customers. Yeah. We have a, a couple sales guys actually who have, apparently they, they just have a, you know, corporate budget and they're allowed to spend below $2,000 a month on professional development. So we were like, okay, price point at 1850 bucks, like, you know, and so we've been playing with that and, and it's still corporate money, but because it's not going through the, the learning and development team, um, there's fewer gates actually that need to be crossed if we keep our price point down yeah. below and then you, two grand. Yeah. And then there's other, again, then you can link to other, you know, institutions or groups or like, the, I don't know what, where the digital workshop is these days, but, you know, they have deals with, again, the state and stuff like that. There still needs places of people to get additional training. So that's a different price level, obviously, yeah. but it's a, it could be a different target where you could still get, you know, again, value there and establish yourself for those, uh, those needs. Great. Thank, Thank you, you, Natalie. Uh, Ryan, this is your two minute warning because I want to wrap some things up. Stephanie, I want to come back to something um, in this is that you talked about most of your revenue is coming from the storytelling stuff previously in the B2B yeah. area. And you're kind of worried at this point in time that B2B is going to be difficult. <laughs> you are not alone. All of us in business services are very worried about that. But I also happen to know that one of the things that you guys are so incredibly good at is this influence piece of how do you develop and use influence in your own individual networking, in your own individual life, and in some of those things. That's going to be your best B2C seller potential. Really? Well, we have 36 million people who don't have jobs right now who are going to be going back into a job market that they yeah. don't know what that's gonna be looking like. We're gonna be scrambling for it. And yeah. your demographic is going to be probably the 10% of those people who are in leadership positions who are going to be scrambling and fighting for middle management, higher management jobs moving forward. Your ability to help them increase their influence yeah. as a leader and as a potential hiree is going to be because those are the people who have enough savings to get through some of this yeah. who also understand that investing in themselves will pay off in the long term run and are yeah. going to be looking for what is the edge i need to come out into the job market better than i left it yeah. and if you can connect with that particular group of folks that's going to provide you that b2c piece i think that you haven't had yet and might be worth really yeah. experimenting with we actually, we have a point of view on the nine sources of influence power, and we've actually developed a, a coaching module for each influence power source. Um, and actually what we have found in the marketplace is that people are in, they will just purchase one. And they're like, I just want to do networking, or I want to do storytelling, or I want to do, you know, per, like willpower. And so that's been interesting. The price point, because it's just a one-off, 
the price point is low, but, but administratively it's very easy because we have the workbook sent and we just do a one phone, one hour phone call and it's done, but it's very transactional. And we're yeah. kind of, we're, I would love to get to a place where it can be more relationship oriented. And I, you know, we'll see, we'll see. But, but I, I think that's a good question, especially because we've been having this existential crisis about are we an influence company or are we a storytelling company? And maybe that will shift the, this whole COVID thing will shift us more towards the, the influence uh, content area again, um, or more holistic, because storytelling is important for influence, but it's it's just so narrow yep. um, compared to the bigger picture. So yeah, we'll think about that too. Great. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Stephanie. Appreciate it. Uh, and so round of a lovely applause for you. <laughs> and Ryan, so we're going to move into Ryan and his presentation on cow tipping. I'm looking forward to this presentation because I originally saw the uh, presentation when it was created at Techstar Startup Weekend. So this company has been in existence since February, guys. Uh, so, and our fun fact about Ryan today is that he has been to 49 countries. And if you ask him, Vietnam's his favorite for the food and Ireland and Thailand are his favorite for the people. And for so, very different Ryan, reasons, yes. Yes. Ryan, and if you will take it away with cow tipping for us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm really grateful. This is my first time with this group, and I'm very grateful for this opportunity to talk to you about cow tipping. This project came out of a Techstars startup weekend in Fort Collins. And when we first pitched it, it was a direct-to-consumer product. Uh, a number of my coaches and mentors, both from Techstars and other groups that I've participated in since then, have really pushed me to look at a B2B model. Unfortunately, because of stay at home and the changes in the restaurant industry, uh, that's really not possible. And even when the restaurants open up, I imagine this is not gonna be their first priority for quite a while. So I have pivoted back to a direct to consumer model and that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. But with that in mind, the first thing I'm looking for from, a gr from this group is kind of how to, re how to revisit my business model. I'm at a very early stage right now, really at a concept stage with a minimum viable product. Also, I would like to find out from you if I've clearly explained two topics that are central to my model, both regenerative farming and carbon offsets. They are complicated topics, but once you understand them, you can't unlearn them, and they're quite amazing, and they are, they are pivotal to my uh, value proposition. And then finally, does my pain point of carbon guilt resonate? And I will start there. Um, so I'm a father of two young girls, and about a year ago, I made a decision to make a career transition into clean energy and climate activism. And as part of that, I started a podcast. I just published my 31st uh, episode this morning, as a matter of fact, and it's called Climate Changers. And one of the perils of being a climate podcaster is even when you're trying to celebrate the wins, you find out a lot of things that you're not really ready to fully understand because it's scary. It's a scary um, challenge that we face. And because of that, I've coined what I call carbon guilt. And there's a specific kind of carbon guilt that I deal with because I am a carnivore. I'm a carnivorous environmentalist. And you find out over and over again how bad livestock is for the climate. Now, on the positive side, and we'll talk about both of these topics in just a bit, carbon offsets and regenerative farming give us an opportunity to revisit that challenge and see how true it really is and ways that we can address it. So it is true. Livestock are responsible for, the sec livestock are second only to energy production in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. And in America alone, we create enough carbon, push enough carbon into the atmosphere from our livestock production, conventional livestock production, to cover the Empire State Building every two hours. So there is a real challenge that we face here. Um, so I'm gonna talk real briefly here about carbon offsets, but carbon offsets allow you to compensate for the carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions that you produce by investing in projects somewhere else that trap carbon somewhere. So it is a bit of a Band-Aid, and that's one of the criticism criticisms of carbon offsets in some cases because you're able to keep on living the way you're living and eliminate the guilt. But I'm going to talk to you about how I address that in a little bit of a different way in just a moment. Uh, but before I do, I want to talk about carbon. Carbon is not our enemy. Carbon is the source of life. Carbon, we are carbon-based life forms, as a matter of fact. And when the carbon cycle is working as it should, the grass and other vegetation works as solar panels and the soil works as a battery and absorbs carbon into the soil. And it turns out that before the pioneers came to the breadbasket of the United States, the Midwest, there were lots and lots of buffalo. And buffalo do a couple things. One is they eat a lot of grass, and that causes the grass to grow deeper roots, which means it pulls carbon deeper into the ground. They also eat a lot of grass and poop it out. 
and then stomp it into the ground, therefore trapping even more and more carbon in the soil. Um, this is kind of, for me, was a groundbreaking realization as part of my podcast that these ungulates that we think of as the enemies of the atmosphere are actually big contributors when they have a proper lifestyle to trapping carbon in the soil. And that not only traps carbon in the soil to save us from climate change, but it also ensures that we're gonna be able to feed future uh, generations of Americans and global, you know, booming global population. Now, what happened is we replaced these, these buffalo with cows. And cows in their traditional, the way they're traditionally raised, emit a lot of greenhouse gases, but do not trap them. But it turns out, and again, this is one of the realizations that I've made through this podcast, and even the episode I published this morning goes into great depth about this, and it really blows my mind. But if you use intensive rotational grazing, you can actually create zero, net zero carbon cattle. So cattle that trap as much or more carbon in the soil than they create in their lifetime. So therefore eliminating carbon guilt. Now the problem is that most of the beef that we have available now does not do that. Um, so that's where cow tipping comes in. So with cow tipping, I am using these carbon offsets. So I am partnering with farms that raise cattle in this way that traps carbon to buy big offsets, right? And then for my customers, I am breaking those big offsets into little pieces that are allocated to a specific meal. So if you're having a burger, you're having a steak, you will put that meal into my carbon calculator. Right now it's live just as a Google form and I have to do all the calculations myself, but I'm using sound science and I'm using certified carbon offsets. And then I will send you a carbon offset equivalent to the carbon created by that meal. Now again, that, so the offset covers that meal some people will criticize that, that it's just a Band-Aid, but we're more than a Band-Aid because we're actually investing in the future of a livestock industry that does not, that is carbon net zero or even traps more carbon in the soil than it creates. Um, and then you know, after you, you enter the, the, the meal into the, the app, it comes back to you again, you get a badge. Right now it's a certificate, a Google certificate. It's, it's, you know, all, it's all minimum viable product that I've just hacked myself but I've got a developer who's gonna help me this weekend try to take it to the next level. But I am hoping to find a development partner who will go in with me in a big way to help me really create a user experience that um, is going to be, uh, draw people in and get the people to talk to their friends about um, cow tipping. So again, what I'm looking for are insights into how I can either build off of this direct to consumer model or revisit my B2B um, business models that I've, you know, sketched out on a business model canvas when restaurants again do open. Um, I'm very open to business models right now. I'm at a very early stage. I also want to be sure that I was able to, in this short period of time, explain regenerative farming and carbon offsets. Some of you may already have known about it, probably carbon offsets, but regenerative farming, I'm a climate activist and it still blows my mind when I talk to these people about what you can do with regenerative farming. And then crucial to my entire business model is does this pain point of carbon guilt resonate with people? Will it be enough to motivate people to enter their meal into the app or whatever business model I end up following to you know, have a tip line at the restaurant that, that offsets that meal? Um, so I'll be really curious to hear that. So in terms of my contact information, uh, Ryan Flayhive, people call me Flavor or Flaves. Um, and it's cowtipping.co. That's just, we were given a free CO URL at the startup weekend. Um, and someone owns the .com. And even I make the mistake all the time of, of writing .com. But cowtipping.co, the carbon calculator is live now. I'm not charging for it. So it's free offset. So I encourage all of you to go in, try it out, and I will send you a certificate of a certified offset. Um, Climate Changers is my podcast, available on any platform that you use for podcasts. And then my um, consulting company is called Backbowl Strategy, and it's an environmental and, um, and a climate consulting company. Great, thank you, Ryan, very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, if you will pop us back to your ask real quick so that everybody can put oh, that in front of them sorry. or at least tell us what it is again so folks can. So we're looking for business models, whether or not carbon guilt is really a thing and what was the third ask you had, Ryan? Oh, can you see my screen? No, not anymore. Oh, sorry. The third ask was whether I was clear enough in explaining regenerative farming and carbon offset offsets. They're critical to my business model. And especially regenerative farming is a very difficult concept to explain, especially in a short period of time. Um, but people need to understand it in order to understand why my product adds value.
Okay, I will tell you that I totally get regenerative farming based on just what you said there. So we're good there. Uh, first hand up is Andrea. Lovely to have you with us, Miss Andrea. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, super. Hey, Ryan, um, love what you're doing. Um, I too was a climate activist in a sense, and I, I decided to be vegetarian because I couldn't handle the the carbon, uh, you know, cost of eating uh, livestock, but I really like meat. <laughs> so I had to make a choice. So I get where you're coming from on this. My, uh, my thought is in relation to business model. Um, have you considered something like a subscription box or, um, you know, a sponsoring an animal, something like that, um, where you would have these pretty much guaranteed payouts, right? Uh, monthly or however that would work instead of having to do the uh, thing that most of us really suck at doing, and that is entering our meals. Because I don't know if you've ever been a meal tracker trying to lose weight, but uh, yeah, you do it for like a day and you're like, I'm over this. <laughs> so I feel like that's a little bit labor intensive on the front end for your for your consumer. I wonder if instead you could, you know, categorize them as like a, you know, moderate meat eater to a severe stream meat eater or something like that, and then offer a subscription where they could, uh, you know, pay off their their debts. Uh, in a sense. So I don't, how do you, how do you ever consider anything like that? That's a brand new, wonderful, amazing idea for me. Thank you. And it okay. does, that is one of the challenges, even for myself, I, I catch myself not doing what I'm supposed to do with my own application at times. So. Yeah. It's just, I feel like it's a little bit of the front end of the work. And, you know, I even think to go further with that is you could create a culture around these extreme meat eaters, right? Like we have this whole diet right now called carnivore. Um, I'm sure you've heard about it and everybody's eating like only meat, but it doesn't mean they don't love the earth. So can you not even make, you know, marketing stuff like t-shirts or um, whatever that says, you know, I love meat and I love the, whatever, I'm a carnivore and I save cows or something, right? Um, that would take it even that further step where people start making this a community that they can engage in with each other. Like, hey, we can have our meat and eat it too, right? <laughs> in a sense. <laughs> Right. Thank it. you, Andrea. And then Matt, I'm going to come to you next. Um, have you, as far as uh, try to expand your your reach, you know, once once you've gotten kind of out of this this MVP MVP phase, um, have you tried reaching out to Joel Salatin? Because I, I assume that that the regenerative farming thing is kind of based on what the work he's done. Because I, I have an uncle who's a huge fan of Joel Salatin and is actually doing the paddock based grazing up in kind of northern Minnesota. Um, but he, I mean, I, I'm sure that people reach out to, to Salton so much with questions directly related to kind of what you're working on um, as a way to sort of uh, micro disperse that those benefits of regenerative farming to, to coin a new term, I guess. I, you know, I'm unfamiliar with Joel. And um, so I'm taking note, I'm going to do some research and invite him to be on my podcast. So that okay. I, that's, that's the beauty of the podcast is I can get pretty much anyone to meet with me <laughs> who may not meet with me otherwise. So um, thank you. That's a great suggestion. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to throw his website in the chat for you. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Matt. Uh, David. Hi there. Um, so I have a couple of thoughts. I mean, so I think there's a problem with trying to get people to create a new habit of like, you know, putting their meals into this app and all this kind of stuff. But I think where you might be more successful would be going more to the source. So for example, you know, if you eat at a Red Robin or, you know, when we can do that sort of thing again, they have those little electronic devices on the table. And if you could partner with them and have a little app on that device or something in their software that would prompt you say, do you want to donate 89 cents to make your steak dinner or your hamburger carbon neutral, you know, so put it right there, you know, or another one would be to partner with the grocery stores and have it where at the time when you check out, you've got this whole basket full of meat and, and the, and the grocery store software knows what you just bought and it could quickly calculate, okay, you need to put in $2 and 47 cents, you know, to support regenerative farming, you know, and, and I think that's where you can, if, if you can get those sorts of things to happen, I think that's where you can build it in so that rather than to get 
to train people somehow to have a new habit of getting out this app every time they eat something. I think, you know, if you can sort of build it into the source and have it be a part of something they're already doing where there's just a little prompt that shows up, I think you might have more success that way. Those are, those are great ideas, David. Thank you. Um, one of the challenges, you know, as we all know, is that those businesses aren't really running yet. Uh, so I'm really hopeful to try out ideas like that um, when they are and when they have bandwidth to talk to me. Uh, one thing I will that I did, I should have put in my presentation that I didn't is that to offset a, like say a quarter pound burger costs two cents, believe it or not. So it's a very, that's a one, if, if one of the important. concerns, if one of the concerns you had was, oh, this is going to make my McDonald's Whopper cost a dollar more. It's not, you know, even with a hundred percent markup, it's going to cost like four to six cents. I want to get us through Stephanie and Greg, uh, and then we'll need to wrap up. There is also a tremendous amount of commentary in the chat when you get done, Ryan, uh, around how we all feel about the word guilt. And I, I think I probably kicked that off with the thing that I need none of the, I need another thing to be guilty about. So you've got some good feedback in there on that. Uh, Stephanie, you first, and then Greg. And Matt, I don't know that we'll get to you for a second round, but we'll see. Um, I've been thinking about this from the influence perspective and what inspires people to do things or not do things. And there were a couple ideas that came to me. One was um, gamification. Is there a way that you can create competitions or, you know, build network communities where people can see what other people are doing? Because there's a lot about the social proof component and then the fact that there's like many challenges maybe that might, might motivate people to participate. Um, the, the other thing about incentives specifically is, is there a way that you can actually shift who's paying? Um, as, the, as the consumer of meat, um, if, I'm the, if I wanna do quote unquote the right thing or like eat the meat that is well produced, then I feel like I should be getting a reward, not be paying more. Um, and so there's something about who, who is paying and how, and how you structure that, um, the payment model. Um, and then the third thing, from an incentive perspective, guilt is actually the worst thing that you can do, for, or sorry, from an influence perspective. Um, nobody wants to feel guilty. And when they do feel guilty, they generally go for immediate, um, they, want, they look for a salve. And so the people who are guilty about having, like breaking their diet are the ones that then go eat ice cream, which is completely counterproductive, but it is how we behave. <laughs> And so if I think if you can yes, focus yes, instead on, on hope and progress and maybe even have like a progress bar and like this is how many, how many Empire State Buildings you've saved or something, um, that, that just gets people more focused on what's good about it rather than what's, what's wrong. Those are all awesome ideas, Stephanie. And with the gamification, we, we actually had that as part of our pitch at, at Techstars and I haven't thought about it since. So thanks for bringing that back up. And I, I appreciate all the other uh, comments you just made. Thank you, very valuable. Great, Greg, we'll come to you. Brian, I, I love the idea. Um, I, what really stuck with me at the start was when you said carnivorous environmentalist. <laughs> and that, that I think somebody mentioned making t-shirts, that I would buy. Uh, <laughs> I love the background with the carbon and you know covering up the it wasn't Statue of Liberty. I forgot what it was, but uh, State cover, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the the big issue for me is, like most people said, it's it's work. It's extra work. And once it comes into plugging something into an app, I'm not willing to do that much. Um, but I agree with like David, who said the partnership with um, a grocer or a restaurant where you're already paying for this, where it's done, I'm willing to pay that extra money so I don't feel the guilt. Um, I think with your app where that can come into play is um, creating that culture and having people become zealots about this idea. It's kind of like Strava where I wanna share this data and I wanna, I wanna preach and show everybody what I'm doing for this positive um, force. And so, um, I, I'm not sure necessarily what to do with that issue, but I, I would definitely say that, um, using something to draw people in, to make a larger culture is big. And another suggestion for your podcast is from, um, getting somebody like Joel Salatin. There was a movie called the big, the biggest small farm. 
I'm sure you've seen that and having them on as well. Thank you though. Awesome. Awesome ideas. Thank you so much. You guys are all right. so generous and I'm very grateful for getting the juices flowing and your encouragement. Matt, I'm going to give you roughly half a minute here if you can get through that era in that. Already put it in the comments. Fantastic. And actually, for those of you who do not know, the three little dots down at the bottom of the comment box, I have it set so you can individually on your computer save the chat. So if there's valuable things in there, uh, we'll go from there. So we're going to move actually quickly. Yay. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate it. Um, and I am especially thrilled to see how far this particular idea has come from Startup Weekend way back uh, back in February to here. You've made a lot of progress very quickly. So excited to see that. So I want to move us into our last portion of the day uh, where we talk about who has a win who could use some help or who has a resource that we have found. Uh, so if you'll put your hands up for those, we'll, we'll start from there. And interestingly enough, I've had uh, a couple of questions from some of our visitors uh, across various platforms as they've been coming in as to why we do this. And there are three particular reasons that I make sure that we do this. One, as entrepreneurs, and so many of us are actually solopreneurs or have very small businesses, we don't have an opportunity to share our wins with people on a regular basis. And that's an opportunity for you to be able to celebrate with other people who understand the depth of the struggle it takes to create what you've just done. Uh, the second piece to that is happy emotions are viral and contagious. And so for those of us who are still slogging through and struggling day to day in building our businesses, hearing other people have success actually breeds success for you. And on the third piece, it's community building for us in the opportunity for you to get to know what other people are doing, how they're uh, operating, and where you as a business owner, entrepreneur, entrepreneur and a generally intelligent human being can help other people out. So that's why we do this particular segment. And so I would love to hear who's had a win this week or who could use some help. David, you've already got your hand up. Thank you. Uh, so, um, I mean, I guess my biggest win of recent history is I've now got a second patent on my Adventure Safely app. Uh, Anything but an actual real issued patent. We got two of them now, so we're very excited about that. Um, where I could use some help is so I've spent about seven, eight years writing this app. It's intended to like people who go out hiking, mountain biking, uh, go off off-road motorcycling, etc., camping. People who go outdoors, it's intended to share your location via text message with someone back home. Text message being used used because they get through when you don't have internet and things like that oftentimes. But so I've got this thing, it's free. People can download it right now. And I've got about 50 downloads. And you know, this was my spring to like really get this thing off the ground. And everybody's thinking about the virus. But on the other hand, you can't go to the movies, but you can go camping, you can go hiking. So it seems like if I just get this in front of the right people, it should get some traction and take off. And so if any of you have any suggestions about that, I'm an IT guy, I'm not a marketing guy, and I have all the success to prove that. Um, so any suggestions you have, I'd really appreciate. First place I will tell you, David, uh, having been active, is any of the Reddit threads that have to do with Colorado hiking Hi. and camping. Because Redditors love this stuff. Um, and they're helpful and they're great. So I would start there uh, and and move from that. And then anyone else with good ideas? A couple of segments of the meeting. Uh, anyone else can kind of move through that. Harrison, how about you? What have you got to share with us? Uh, well, I finally got the coloring card deck done and got that to my gift today. So uh, that was a good one. Um, and I also got a call. Um, this last week from somebody who is doing a book review on art for the masses instead of the asses. And <laughs> we'll, we'll be doing a Zoom interview with her as well uh, that she will uh, record. So that gives marketing information out there uh, as well. Uh, so, so that was, you know, a second. Chris um, has your book handy to show it off for us all here. <laughs> 
yeah, it's a great win for us, Harrison. So <laughs> to have your art with us. That's fantastic. Very excited to hear that, Harrison. And I can't wait to see the Color Pocket deck uh, in its full glory. So that'll be great. Anyone else with wins or help needed? I know that I have some help I need. I am posting here uh, in the chat right now. So Launch NoCo is putting on next week on Thursday morning, a three hour online interactive workshop for people who are setting up their businesses and need to get through the appropriate paperwork to do that. So there are three types of people who would be useful to have at this. One, you haven't set up your business yet and wanna make sure that you get all of the right paperwork, insurance, bank accounts, all of that kind of stuff done. Or two, you've set up your business recently and you're not sure that you've finished all of the crappy paperwork that goes with putting your business together. Or three, people who are helping other folks figure out how to start their businesses. This is a good informative workshop so that you make sure you have the information you need. Uh, I'll be publishing the schedule for that later today, but it is designed primarily to be able to do the work while we are in the workshop. So we'll take you through setting up the Secretary of State, getting your EIN, what paperwork do you need to get your business banking account, and Elevations Credit Union will be on the call, setting appointments to actually open your business banking accounts. We'll have what insurance you need, uh, what contracts and other legal documents you might need, and then we'll also have how to set up your uh, accounting and prepare for your quarterly taxes. So those things will all happen next week um, and I would love for you guys to help me get that word out. We're really aiming for 20 to 25 folks in that uh, and we will be working with the cities to make sure that we have the appropriate paperwork for each individual city that you need to file and those sorts of things. So I would really appreciate you guys helping us get that kind of word out. Any other wins? I know Renee had to run, it looks like, but she had one. Uh, her oldest daughter finished her AP test on Wednesday and is now a high school graduate. So all of our graduates who are coming around out there. Stephanie, what is yours? Um, well, this is sort of a fun one. Um, I hired an intern, which is just kind of really cool. So that's, we, we, uh, we managed to get somebody who's going to help us internally with our marketing, which is just fun. And, and it's exciting to have, um, to grow the team in some ways, even though it's a short term thing, it's, it's fun. New vibrancy is always a great that's thing. That's right. That's right. Fantastic. Any last, last call? All right, so we are at 10.01 and I appreciate all of you guys coming and showing up and providing fantastic feedback this morning and we will see you next week. As always, if you're interested in presenting, reach out. We'll have slots in the latter half of June. Is the link always the same every week? It, this link is now the permanent link, yes. Lovely, all right, thanks. Bye all right, Take care. thanks guys, take care.